Hey guys, welcome back. My name is Nick. This week I start making a curly maple keepsake slash jewelry box. Let me show you what I did. As I just mentioned, I had a really gorgeous piece of curly maple lying around for quite some time. I was kind of saving for a special occasion and I figured a keepsake slash jewelry box for my wife would be the perfect occasion. I could kind of measure and get kind of an idea of what size I could get of a keepsake box out of this board. And then I also did a kind of rough sketch to make sure that my kind of design was on paper. Sometimes that helps me. I began by just trying to rip some straight edges and trying to kind of get down to S4S or surfaced on all four sides, just so that I had some you know solid areas that I could measure from. It was, it was a little bit choppy in spots. So again, I have the table saw, just kind of getting everything down to size. And as I got into it, I could already tell I was gonna love this piece of curly maple. It's just, just the curls and the density of them, I was absolutely in love. Couldn't wait to get finish on it. Being the piece was so nice, I wanted to be rather precise. I had some some bark in some, you know, different spots and just a couple tear out pieces that I had to work around. And I didn't have any more of this wood laying around, so I wanted to make sure that I was really kind of, you know, dialed into exactly where the pieces went, where I was going to get them out of the board. So I definitely took my time to make sure that that was going to happen. I even ended up putting some uh, solvent on it just to make sure that I could see the actual grain and kind of what it was going to look like with finish. And this was going to be the section that I was going to use for my top. The top is actually going to be kind of unique. It's an idea I came up with that I think is really cool. And it's actually going to be a two piece top. I knew I was going to be bringing this over to the planer to try and get the surfaces to be somewhat uniform as well. So I took the time to mark the pieces on the edge. That way when I ran it through the planer, I wasn't eliminating all the layout marks I just put on there. This board actually had a slight cup to it and I, I put it crown side up in my planer and I just wanted to do just kind of some skim, some really light passes so that the infeed and outfeed roller aren't compressing that cup down to the planer bed. And then I can just take some light passes and hopefully try to eliminate that crown. When doing this, I actually realized that my layout line where that crown was, was coming off first. So that was a visual indicator that what I was doing was working. I was removing that cup from the board. And so I figured I'd pop out my phone and take a picture of it. And you can see right here, I'm exactly eliminating that high spot and not flattening the board too much when it goes through the planer. Once it was out of the planer, I just restored the markings that for all my layout, my pieces on the face of the board itself. And then I could take it over to my table saw crosscut sled and cut the pieces to rough length. And I'll emphasize that it's rough length at this point. I know that my planer produces snipe and I allow for that. Also, I wanted a little bit of leeway as far as the top of the box being able to pick the grain. And it was just gonna be an off cut anyway, so I left the top rather long and I also accounted for snipe and on the sides um, I'll talk about the sides more later why I left those a little bit long and then I just brought in my rip fence and cut the pieces to their kind of rough width as well I left those a little bit wide I'll talk about that as well in a little bit but uh, you know just kind of cutting the pieces removing some of the imperfections some of the bark areas again just triple checking to make sure everything is exactly where I needed it where I wanted to cut I didn't want to mess around with this piece. Like I said, I didn't didn't have a, any more of this and I wanted to make sure, you know, you can't uncut wood. So I figured I would take my time and make sure that everything went according to plan. Then it was a trip over to the bandsaw and this was the sides and I was resawing the sides, uh, this piece in half. And it was, each half was gonna yield me a long side and a short side to the box. And then when you open it up, you get a continuous grain completely around the box. And I figured for a piece like this, it would be worth doing. For the top and bottom pieces, they were a little bit wider. So I just raised the guard on the bandsaw and proceeded to resaw the top as well. Now with the top, I, I alluded to earlier, it's gonna be kind of a unique design. It's gonna be a two piece top. So I, ne I needed to make sure that I had kind of a top and bottom to the top, if that makes any sense. But then with the bottom, I figured I would just resaw that. So I would save on having to plane it all into chips. And I could probably use that off cut as a, you know, some knife scales or something later on. Then it was off to everybody's favorite part, which is sanding. Uh, kind of my methodology, ideology behind sanding in this case is with these smaller type items, these keepsake boxes and things of that, 
you're gonna be holding them a lot of times and actually being able to get them real up close to your face and, and you're gonna be able to see every little imperfection. So I did my due diligence here. I took my time to make sure to get all the sanding, you know, work my way through the grits. I don't necessarily do this with say like a cabinet carcass, but you know, it's just one of those things where if it's a smaller keepsake item, there you go. No matter how particular you are with sanding and trying to keep that sander flat, on some of these smaller pieces, you're going to get the corners to kind of, the sander to dip down. And if you put these two pieces together, like you can see here, you can see that those corners don't, you know, they're, they're rounded over a little bit. And I knew that going into this, that's another reason why I left these pieces long, because then I could bring those back to my table saw sled and cut those to length and cut those portions off. That way when you go to do your miters later, you're not gonna have any varying thickness to the material and everything is gonna be nice and ready to go. Here the after shot, you can see that I pretty much eliminated that problem by just cutting you know, anywhere from a quarter to a half inch off the length. Being I was gonna do the continuous grain box, I made sure to lay out all of my miters so that it was, I had really nice visual indicators, again, not to screw up any of the components because now I could take my table saw blade and tilt that to 45 degrees, and then using a miter gauge with a sacrificial fence attached to it, I can cut all my miters. There's a lot of benefits to you know having a sacrificial fence like this, but one of the major ones that I like is you can see exactly where that blade kerf is gonna go. So if you're trying to cut right to a line to make sure that you know that's an exact sized part, that way you know exactly where that blade's gonna come through. It's a nice visual indicator. I did set up a stop block for a couple of the parts just to kind of make sure that everything was nice and uniform, everything was the same, and yeah, just performed all these cuts. And you can see here I was pretty meticulous about getting it right on the line, but it, it pays off in the end when you go to glue it up and everything is actually just the way you need it, just the way you want it. The best advice that I can give for anyone doing any type of mitered boxes or you know mitered picture frames is you at least have to have two pairs of equal length sides so you have to have you know unless you're doing a square they could all be the same but if you have a long side just a hair longer than you know the other long side you're not going to get it matched up no matter even whether you had it at perfect 45 degree or not here i just have it mocked up a little bit and you can see i have arrows kind of pointing in a clockwise direction as well as numerically as far as which piece and that's just to ensure that i have that grain continuity continue throughout here's a picture of one of the corners where you can see that grain kind of wrap right around the corner it's just a, a nice presentation for a small box like this earlier i said i'd left the sides a little bit wider and at this point i'm cutting them down to their final width I actually trim off of both sides so i'll just do a skim cut on one side and that's basically to eliminate if you had any tear out when you were doing your miter cuts if there was any tear out now cutting it to final width is going to eliminate that then it was time to cut the dados for the top and bottom uh, i lowered my blade and slid my fence over a little bit and just made one pass and then moved the fence over slightly and then made another pass basically widening that dado and I just was testing it. This particular one was for the bottom and I could just kind of do a test fit. It was a little bit snug yet. Slide the fence over, make another pass. And that dado basically widens out until you have a kind of a, almost a nice friction fit. For the top, being my top was gonna be unique, I had to kind of size that up a little bit different. I had a piece here of scrap red velvet. That's actually gonna be what's laminated between the two pieces of the top. So I had to make sure when I was testing that, that I had that velvet in there so that it allowed for that thickness. With the box temporarily set up into a strap clamp, I can then measure for the length and the width for both the two top pieces and the bottom piece. Then it's just a matter of taking them back to the sled, squaring up one side, and then cutting those to length. Before I cut the tops to length, like again, I, I was super worried that I was gonna get kind of the wrong section of the grain and a gift for my wife, so I wanted to make sure she had a peek at it. So I just roughly quick cut out a heart. Uh, that was gonna be kind of the motif for the top. And I had her play around with it, move it around. It, she got to slide the box on the actual piece and kind of pick the grain that she thought was the most visually appealing as well. Um, oddly enough, she got into this and kind of enjoyed it, got, got to be able to pick it. So, hey, that worked out for me. And here, my wife sets her ring down in the box, alluding to what that heart is for in the first place. 
Even at this point, with all this careful checking, I went to rip the top pieces to final width, and for whatever reason, even with my markings and everything, it just it looked a little odd. So I, I, I triple checked and made sure that I was, you know, cutting those where I should be. And then enough to make any mom proud, I was able to draw one half of a heart with one try. You guys remember kindergarten, right? Just fold it in half and cut it out with the scissors. No running. Then I could just mark the center line to the top of the top. So I'm making sure not to cut the wrong piece here because there actually was a piece that looked a little bit better. The other piece will be the inside of the top. And then once I drew that center line, I could just trace that heart out and bring that over to the scroll saw. And oddly enough, I think this is my first scroll saw project. I think the next one I'll do will be a self portrait. It's basically a circle. Once I had the heart cut out, I just kind of set it next to some velvet. You guys are kind of picking up on what I'm putting down here as far as what that velvet's gonna be for. And then just use some sandpaper to make sure that the edges of the heart were nice and soft. I actually wanted to do a eighth inch radius, but the way that how thin this material was, the bearing wasn't gonna ride on anything. And being I came up with this idea, I wasn't exactly sure how to finish the actual project itself because I didn't want that velvet getting any finish on it. So I took the time now to apply some lacquer to the top of the box. That way I hopefully can avoid having to spray any finish near the velvet. But I do think I have a better plan for that, but that'll have to wait for the second part of this video. Well, that'll have to wrap up part one for this video. Uh, if you click down in the description below, it'll be a link to the second part of this video. I just completely ran out of time and I, I promised quite a few people on social media that I would have something out. I thought this would be a cool box for like uh, Valentine's or an anniversary, a birthday gift, that type of thing. Uh, you could probably figure out where I'm going with the velvet in the center of the heart. That was something my wife actually came up with. I thought it was an almost like genius idea. So I just had to go out to my shop right away and just start making this. And well, like I said, I just, I didn't get it done completely in time, but check the link down in the description below. And if this is your first time here, I encourage you guys to hit that subscribe button as well as that bell notification so you can get uh, notified anytime I have any type of shenanigans going on here. But uh, that's about all I have for you. So until I see you guys next time, you guys take care. Part one, I literally clapped sawdust into my eye just now. See, I should have been wearing the safety glasses.